Well, thank you. It's it's Linda starting out. Um, I just want to say that uh, Judy and I were here in scenic downtown uh, Nelson and been through the Slocan Valley, beautiful uh, meeting with people interested in this topic of how do we create communities of powerful curiosity. And I think BC now and the Yukon are known for being outstanding in this area. So we're, we want to start by expressing our gratitude actually to the association through our publication of Spirals of Inquiry and then um, the sales of the Spiral Playbook we, and, and the stories of BC principals uh, and formal and informal leaders in leadership mindsets. We've been able to um, keep the, the network spirit of generosity of providing small grants to schools that are curious and are willing to write down their stories. And I'm sure many of the people on this webinar today and the ones who listen to it in the future um, have, have been the beneficiaries of, of that generosity. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, we feel really fortunate to, to be on this um, incredible team of BC people because we're last, we were able to hear the other webinars and what, what a rich um, resource that is. Uh, again, kudos to the association for, for pulling this off. This is, a, uh, is going to be a real boost to the work. So Brad and Faye and Shelley, uh, first names to every educator in BC and, and much of Canada and much of the world actually. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here. Um, I just want to go back um, for a moment to to where we've gotten started personally with this curiosity work. It did, many of you know, it started with um, a bit of provincial funding. Um, and, you know, the question we were asked originally, and we were curious to, to think about this, is how can we uh, use learning progressions to deepen student learning in the areas of literacy, mathematics, and we call it human decency, social responsibility. And we were happy to take that on. And much to our surprise and delight, what's now happened is that there's international interest and there's emerging networks in, you know, sometimes it's hard to keep up, but 10, between 10 and 15 places of the world and the, the world, we're all learning from each other. And we're now beginning to get actually hundreds of, uh, principals and vice principals in particular, and some teachers wanting to come and visit and understand more about this work. So we wanted to understand more about this work. So what we did, these, these are our goals, and I'm going to speak to those in, in just a moment. But what Judy and I did in prep, preparation for the webinar was really fun. We generated a list of, you know, 25 or 30 principals that we met and vice principals that we met in the last little while who really are incredibly curious and who are driving this work forward in their schools. And we started to talk about what are their characteristics. So for the rest of the webinar, we want you to keep in mind that this is um, emergent thinking and it was really fun to do. So again, um, thanks for the opportunity. Many people listening have been part of creating these goals that we want every young person to cross the stage with dignity, purpose and options. We want every young person leaving our schools more curious than when they arrive. And we want every learner, adult and young person, with an understanding of and respect for an indigenous worldview. These are ambitious goals and you have to have curiosity uh, drive you forward. You have to have collective curiosity to, to achieve them. So what um, do we think, how do we think you get there? That's the question. What are the characteristics of school leaders, formal and informal, but particularly for today, principals and vice principals who are actually building cultures of curiosity and moving their school schools towards these goals. And we do have examples now in the province of, of schools and, and actually whole districts that are really moving in ambitious ways um, to get this these ambitious goals uh, achieved, which is fantastic. So five considerations for you to think about. Um, the first one is that the, there isn't one of these leaders that we've thought of, and most of them are here in BC, a couple in the Yukon and some overseas. Everyone is a genuinely curious person themselves. And that may sound kind of obvious, but 
it isn't obvious. I don't think we always hired for curiosity. I think we hired for other things than formal leaders. And uh, Susan Engel's book, The Hungry Mind, which is about the origins of curiosity in childhood, um, you know, is a very popular book when we provide copies. She noticed um, that teachers who enhanced curiosity in their classrooms smiled more, had warm interactive relationships with people, and also told small stories about themselves at, at the age of the kids they were serving, um, about a time when they were curious and, and, and made it quite personal. And we, we find exactly the same thing with the, the formal principals and vice principals who chair this work. And you can see it actually in the webinars too. People tell small stories about their life. Uh, it makes it personal. They exude this curiosity. They do smile more. I couldn't think of one of these formal leaders who isn't, doesn't greet you with a smile. And those warm interactive relationships uh, are characterized by kind of listening to people. And uh, listening has a power in the curiosity work. So uh, we've also found that they're drawn to work, to, to work, uh, to key resources that they use with their staff. So in Australia, you'll see that every curiosity school has um, a copy of The Power of, of Inquiry, which is a fantastic book by Kath Murdoch. And, um, and many of them, because they're expeditionary learning schools, are using Ron Berger's book. You know, when we like these ideas so much that we're going to write about them. So this is just going to be uh, a high level um, talk. I'm going to go on to the, the second characteristic that we see in all of these schools. And Brad, Brad, I think really nailed this one. They, they, they demonstrate deep respect. It's not just respect and it's not just courtesy. Um, they listen, they watch, and they show respect. And Debbie Layton Stevens, who is a Shimshan educator, um, has influenced our thinking about leadership a lot. They, they do walk slowly. They walk beside people. And they're the known face. You know, they're they're not hidden away. They're in the environment, demonstrating um, their curiosity. And I think that those are two of the, the things. And and they, well, it's just they're all wonderful people to be around. And I think it, it speaks to um, you know, particularly in our province, the quality of people who step forward and say, yes, I will take on this additional set of tasks. Uh, they are impressive people intellectually and personally. So Judy's going to talk about three more things. So we've got genuinely curious people uh, who are demonstrating deep respect, particularly through listening. And the other thing that we found is that our most um, inquiry-oriented principals and vice principals are always seeking evidence. They're kind of living in that place of scanning uh, to some degree all the time and always come back to what's going on for our learners and how do we know. They're comfortable with challenging biases and assumptions and eager to really kind of probe what's actually going on. Um, an example of this would be a principal recently in, um, in Australia. Um, they do acknowledgement of territory just as we do, but she was wondering, what does this mean to the, the kids in her school? So she asked them, she said, what does the acknowledgement of territory mean to you? And found out that it meant absolutely nothing or very little. And from that point, they went on and they really, that formed the basis of an inquiry for the next term. Uh, the kids learned an enormous amount. Linda and I were fortunate enough to see the, uh, the demonstration of what they've learned in a very, very emotional way at their symposium in August. And it came from her really wondering. Um, another example, one of the things that we learned from the transition study, the, the research study that the network was involved in on improving transitions for Indigenous learners, was that we, before we ask what do these kids need, we need to ask who are these kids? So we were really, at North Delta, um, led by Aaron Acuna and the leadership team there, that started the year in September by, or in August rather, by visiting the home of every single grade eight learner 
just to meet them, greet them, and find out who they are. Uh, an absolutely fantastic example of the importance of being, belonging, and, and becoming. And a final example of evidence-seeking connect to our goal of Indigenous understandings was a school in Northern BC a few years ago, and uh, the, the principal asked the grade four to seven learners just on a, an index card to answer the question, whose territory are we on? And the responses were disappointing. Um, and again, that formed the basis of a year long set of inquiries around the identity of the school and the identity of the learners. So this is evidence seeking around what's going on for our learners and how do we know and we, um, we just see the importance of that, of challenging our assumptions, challenging our biases and asking the questions. The next part to that con connected to evidence seeking is the importance of listening to learners. And, and we've said repeatedly uh, that the scanning process involves listening to learners and asking some, some key questions. And we have found that where principals do that, principals and vice principals do that, the learning is phenomenal. And just the first question, can you name two learners in this build, or two adults in this building who believe you'll be a success in life? Just that question uh, can lead to profound changes in the, in the building. We liked one school in, uh, in Kelowna that when asked this question, the, one of the students said, this is my best day ever. And the reason she said that, it was the first time anybody had asked her about her learning. Then we've been, been, we're impressed by some schools that we've been working with in England. And this is a school that serves kids who are on the autism spectrum and struggled with, with verbal communication. But the principal, vice principal, and the teachers were determined to elicit the information from their kids. And this is what they got from one of their their uh, young people using a nonverbal communication device. The teachers get an understanding of me. I can be more independent in my own learning. I like to be honest. I like to tell people how I feel. I like that I could tell you what I want. So our inquiry oriented um, principals and vice principals, they ask the kids, they find ways to get the information from them and then they use it. And we are really, really pleased with the impact of that. The next thing that we see that um, our strong principals and vice principals do is that they create the conditions for adult learning. And those of you that have worked with us directly know our um, deep respect for Helen Timperley, who was the first researcher in the world to say, what kind of teacher professional learning actually makes a difference to students? And we've invested millions, probably billions of dollars in professional learning that has actually not amounted to much of anything. We know a lot more now. And has two new books coming out. Um, you see coming soon on the one on the left, it should be out sometime in November. And the one on the right, Leading Professional Learning, responding to complexity with adaptive expertise is out now. And she has taught us, and we really believe this, that the complex problems that we're facing in our schools, how to create inclusive environments for every learner, how to meet the needs of every student, how to ensure that every young person crosses the stage with dignity, purpose, and options, that those are complex problems that can't be solved with the expertise that we already have that requires adaptive expertise. And the only way we can develop that is through collaborative inquiry and through conversations with each other. So we really acknowledge the, the principals and vice principals who are managing to find ways uh, within the school day for teachers to grapple with some of these challenging, challenging problems. And the school that we were at today it was just a fascinating experience because they've identified that their kids give up really easily, even though they're um, extremely successful outside in nature, where they aren't very successful is sticking to math, sticking to reading and so on. And it's gonna be fun to watch that school over the next few months because they've got a focus 
they're working together, and uh, we think they're gonna make some big changes. And the principal is creating the conditions for those conversations to, to take place. So creating the conditions for adults to learn in the school, focused on complex problems, uh, using a collaborative approach, um, those are the, the principles that are making the big gains in, in, from our perspective. Uh, the last point that we'd make, so we say that principals are curious, they are respectful, they are evidence seeking, they listen carefully to their learners, they create the conditions, they're also resourceful and persistent. So the image of the water around the rocks is to say, if we can't find one way through, we'll find another way. And we just um, um, can't say enough about the principals who try something, it may not work perfectly, but instead of saying, oh, we did that, didn't work, let's try something else, actually go back and say, what, what was happening there? What can we do better? How can we work together? Um, in a smarter way? What can we learn from each other? And how can we persist? Because we know that what we're after is, is just so important. So I think that um, one of the things that, that we see in terms of the resourcefulness too is kind of the positivity. So starting from, from the strengths and building on the strengths in the school and then creating that story or that narrative of what could be, so creating the new stories and then being persistent in the um, realization of those stories. So it's combining that um, narrative inquiry, appreciative, critical and reflective in a persistent way that is, is, um, is kind of the hallmark, I think, of the, the principles that, that we see. Um, and the, the very last point that, that we're going to make, and then we'll open it up to Kevin and to others for, for questions, and we'd be happy to respond to anything, is, well, two things, actually. One is, because is, this is connected to the notion of resourcefulness, uh, this is The Flight of the Hummingbird, which was the, the book provided to kindergarten students this year, and is also being turned into the children's opera through the Vancouver Opera. It'll be the touring opera next year. But it's the, the, if you haven't read it, it's the story of how one hummingbird in the face of a forest fire, instead of flying away with the other animals to seek safety, flew into the fire with a drop of water and dropped one by one drops of water on the, on the fire. And when the other animals asked what he was doing, he said, well, I can't do much, but I can do this. And I think that that's what we see, that persistence, that finding the one thing that we can do that makes a difference is, um, is what great principals do and do day after day after day. And the final, this is an image from Val Malescu. She is an artist who lives on Haida Gwaii. She's of Cree and Romanish heritage. And she is, um, she's really a fantastic artist. Several years ago, she had a, uh, a brain aneurysm and was, was very, very sick. Uh, when she came back, her art changed considerably. And at her first show on Haida Gwaii, one of the elders came up to her and said, Val, your work is so much better since you've lost your mind. And she tells this story with a great big hilarious laugh. Uh, and so you see in her work, there is spaces. And we think that the spaces um, represent the energy in our school that is just waiting to be captured and unleashed. Yesterday, we met with four beginning teachers at, uh, at a, a secondary school. And I would hold those teachers up with the best teachers anywhere in the world. Committed, passionate, uh, smart. And their, their principal and vice principal were supporting them in their growth and giving them the opportunity to take leadership. So that's the notion of unleashing energy, finding the talent, uh, supporting it, and letting it loose. Um, so I'm going to stop at that point and, uh, and again, turn it over, Kevin, to you and open it up for questions from both Linda and I. I do have a question of my own. You've talked about... Um creating space within the day to find time to have those meaningful conversations. And I'm curious about um, 
good examples that you've seen, maybe informal examples. I know for those of us, you know, we've worked in sort of collaborative structures and professional learning communities, but how on a day-to-day -day basis would you recommend principals and vice principals can sort of find the time to even engage in a quick, meaningful conversation or exchange with teachers? Are there any sort of um, good tips and tricks that you've seen out there in schools? <laughs> well, I, I'm going to come at that in two ways. It's a great question, and I think it comes up you know, a lot as we, we look at our practice as formal leaders. Um, you know, both in, in secondary and elementary leadership, what I've observed and what I tried to practice myself was just making sure that as soon as the bell rang, um, I took the first hour of every day and I was in every classroom um, in a smaller school and in a and one that was quite big. I found that those small interactions with young people, I wasn't as always as equipped with a smarter question of what if you're learning is why you're important, but I would, it would now be my practice. Uh, and I think many of the educators that we work with in our formal leadership programs um, have made this a way of life. You have to decide for yourself how long it will be. An hour worked for me. Um, but, you know, a half an hour is better than than nothing. If it's if it's in your calendar and you just make it a habit, then those interactions and then later in the day coming back to teachers and saying, you know what, this is what, you know, Judy said when I when I asked her, this is what I I asked a young boy in an in English school recently. I said, what's something that's been important to you in your learning recently? And he thought for a long time and he said, I think last year when we were learning uh, how to make something more beautiful, it's really stuck with me. And I thought, wow, you know, what a great school. So those conversations can be profound. They don't have to take long. And I think that's one. I think at the, the formal level, I love the way people figure out um, how, in, you know, with budgetary constraints, because we notice in Australia that they have a lot more money to invest uh, at the school level in professional learning for staff and plentiful uh, TOCs. But people are finding ways to do things. My favorite one has a, uh, a name that's hard to pronounce. It's thirds days. So it sounds like Thursdays, but it's actually a day a term where there's enough um, coverage arranged in some imaginative way so that every chunk of the staff can have a conversation. And this particular principal, um, what she does is she, she um, organizes the thinking for the day and then she acts really as a recorder and curator of the conversation so that as each group meets, she can tell them what the group before had to say so that the day builds. I, mean, I think it's a wonderful example of unleashing energy and, and that's a school that um, cumulatively over the years by using that Thursday methodology with a lot of informal conversation in between the times uh, really has been able to move things along for learners and open up their practice for other schools to learn from. So I think, you know, I think when we write again, Kevin, this is the kind of thing that we need to write about in detail because there's lots right. of wonderful practices in BC and the Yukon and our, you know, and financially, our, our system is, as you know, sometimes more challenged to do these things than other places, but we find ways. And I think that's why resourceful is one of our, our um, capabilities of the inquiry leader uh, that we see in our schools that we're so impressed by. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just come in really quickly on that and say that sometimes our meetings are too long. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and that nobody wants to sit through a bad meeting. So I think that it, the, also what we're seeing is principals who are able to create short focus periods of time, like a half an hour to 45 minutes, but where it's really clear what the focus of that time is going to be is can be much more effective than a half day or a great lengthy meeting after school. So we're really looking at that time built in during the day. Uh, using the resources within the school effectively to spring teachers to do the work when they're freshest. The evidence that I think staff members paid attention to was the evidence that they, they had a high degree of trust in. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what, what are those pieces of data that we find in school that you think that would be pieces of data with, high, with, a, with a high level of trustworthiness in it 
um, for, for all staff members? Are there specific criteria, I think, that would better able to have a sort of a meaningful conversation about that as opposed to being, you know, having some staff members who might be a little bit dismissive of that type of data? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's interesting. We, um, vocabulary is really important, I think, in, in our, our current attempt in, in BC to be one of the most future focused education systems in the world. And so um, as part of a North American system, I think sometimes the word data became just numeric um, organized charts that we learned, you know, not to stand beside when we were uh, presenting the <laughs> the data sets to to other adults. I what we found over and over, and it's been so interesting working in different systems that actually getting people, um, you know, the question about can you name a couple of adults in this building who believe you'll be a success in life? We have yet to find uh, a teacher or an educator in any system that doesn't find the evidence that they get from asking some set of young people, whether it's every person in the building or a subset, um, it is an energy unleasher. And I think it's because it is a social and emotional question. I think it's because social and emotional learning has become a legitimate part of systems um, globally. And uh, I think with a renewed curriculum, we do have an opportunity in BC and with people like Kim Shona Reichel hanging around uh, with, the, with the research evidence. That's a piece of evidence that's experienced very differently and very personally in a really good way, even if the answers you get aren't what you want. Because the second part of that question is, uh, Kevin, can you, um, you know, you've named, you know, Mr. Bob and Mrs. Harry. Um, can you tell them how, can you tell us how, how they show you that they believe that you'll right. be a success? Right. And that evidence is actually uh, teaches us what kind of relationships we should be building and how we go about it. And I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I was an introverted English teacher. Um, when I started my practice, I hid in the book room until all the learners were in the class and then went in afterwards, right? It, I never learned in my teacher education. And I didn't have enough opportunity to go around and see what smart people were doing. The notion that I might, you know, greet the young people at the door by name and all the rest of it. So it's when when people hear the answers to the questions around the world, there's two forms that the kids say. It's either uh, she really cares about me, knows who I am and, and is supportive to me and then says how, or they say, um, she or he really pushes me. And I think educators mm -hmm. learn a lot from that. So dwelling on that, and we have some BC schools now uh, <coughs> where 100% of kids can name five human beings in the mm -hmm. building that, um, that they know believe in them. And I think mm -hmm. that is a huge success story. So I think, it's, I think we've been putting too much evidence on, on the wrong forms, uh, an overwhelming numerical form and not enough on the personal, this is in your control as an educator to ask young people these questions, mm -hmm. listen to the answers, you know, mm -hmm. show respect by wanting to find out from learner's yeah. voice. Yeah, and I'll just, just add to that. I think that, that the, the evidence that teachers um, and the principals find most compelling is the evidence from their own students. So when it's close to the classroom, um, the closer it is to the classroom, the closer it is to the individual student, the stronger, the, the more attention that we pay to it. So that first question, we've just said that's absolutely fundamental. And you know, our second big question, what are you learning and why is it important? If kids can't answer that, it doesn't matter what we're doing, uh, we're missing the boat. So, so we need to really pay attention to, um, to the big key areas of metacognition and social emotional connectedness. So mm -hmm. we start with that. Uh, we don't say don't, you know, don't pay attention to your FSA or your grad results or anything, because that's all part of the picture, but mm -hmm. let's hook people in with evidence that really matters to the kids that they're serving. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I have a comment and a question from Jackie Kersey. Welcome, Jackie. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Jackie Kersey. Yeah. Thank you, Judy and Linda. You always re-energize me, exclamation mark. 
Uh, I'm wondering how I can foster curiosity around the topic of assessment. How do we approach assessment from a place of genuine curiosity? Oh, uh, great. Well, Jackie, we miss you. Um, and we know you're doing wonderful work. I think it's really exciting for us in Canada right now because there's been a resurgence of interest in assessment for learning. Uh, that's how we got started 22 years or so ago uh, in the network. I, I honestly think that, um, you know, that everybody needs to watch Austin's Butterfly. That's Ron Berger teaching. It's the best video that's ever been been made, I think, educational video. It's short. You see the power of an ethic of excellence and creativity <coughs> demonstrated. I think um, then moving from there and getting both his his book on, you know, learners and then he's got a companion book right now that's just come out it's got a 2020 um, date on it and the combination of those two books and the expeditionary program websites helps you move that forward as Linda's having a coffee <laughs> attack here um, I'll, I'll just say again I think to get people um, curious about assessment. It's also starting their own experience in assessment and taking the time for them to, to talk about what worked for them and didn't work for them as learners themselves. And then also just the, to play with the notion, I, I know Jackie that you're working in, in China, but um, the, the evidence from, you know, this is from Dylan Williams work from a long time ago, that if we place a mark on a piece of work and a comment, um, the kids will ignore the comments. They'll just look at the mark and then they'll toss the work, toss the toss it, put it in their binder, their locker, the garbage can. Um, and just playing out that notion and having teachers be curious about that, I think can be really helpful. So it's taking some of the key ideas of formative assessment and then having teachers personalize that to their own experience and then have them um, again, asking their their young people that they're serving what their experiences are um, is a starting point. Great, and thank you for that. And uh, we are coming to the end of our time together, so I really want to appreciate uh, Judy and Linda giving some time for us. What I didn't mention at the beginning was that uh, Judy and Linda were in the Slocan Valley and raced back to Nelson and got online just moments before this presentation. And so really thank you for your commitment and uh, to be online to share some of your thoughts and learnings with our members. It's greatly appreciated. Um, maybe just a, an opportunity for a final comment before we wrap up our time together. Well, I, uh, Kevin, I just want to say thank you very much. This is, you know, it's, I think that, um, the best job I ever had in the system was as a principal. Uh, I think I continue to think as a principal and I love the opportunity to work with principals. In um, May of this year, um, May 28th to 30th, there's going to be a conference at, at UBC that's going to be co-sponsored, hopefully with the principals association, superintendents and the network uh, called um, kind of from the leading edge. And Linda and I are part of the organizing team for that. And it could be an opportunity for um, BC educators to share their work on a bigger global stage because we've got a number of international speakers coming. So just kind of mark your calendar. It's gonna be a fun, neat yeah, opportunity. Thanks. So May 28th to May 30th, a plug for the leading edge. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Yeah, we absolutely would love to be a part of that. And, and, uh, and um, I'm sure everyone else saw online and we'll make sure that they mark that in their calendars as well. Um, thank you again, Linda and Judy. You've just been fantastic supporters of our association and principals and vice principals around the province. And we greatly appreciate the opportunity, not just for uh, the video, but this opportunity to share a little bit more of your uh, the remarkable work that you do out inside BC and outside BC and, and I know that we could go much deeper on a lot of these different pieces and perhaps we'll find another time to do that. And so with that, thanks again to Linda Judy. Thank you to all of our participants and I will bring our webinar to a close. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, thank Kevin. You.